thinking to myself, if I keep coming to New Beginnings, I'm going to have to learn to name this. <laughs> At this point, that's not a skill I suggest. Uh, isn't God awesome? <laughs> if you have your Bibles, you can put them down. Because I promise you, you do not have the version that I'm going to read. In the 2014 year, the second one, the word of the Lord came to me, and I heard the voice of the bishop say, Thou shalt take it and be an offering. And I replied unto the Lord, Flash Bishop, Nay, for I know not what words to say. And he replied, that has never stopped thee before. <laughs> so I inquired the Lord, slash bishop, from whom shall I take it, this offering? And he said, of this people and congregation shalt thou take it. And I inquired again of the Lord, slash bishop. And I asked, how much shall I take it? And he replied, all of it. That is 1 Stephen 3.15. My own version. And I did that because all the guys before me through the week took all the good scriptures I had to make them. <laughs> but the Bible does say, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, we all know it. It says that God loveth the cheerful giver. And it, as I thought about the joy that we have had this week at Camp Meeting, Amen. the pleasure that it has been to be here, and I'm sure, I thought, wow, you know, three days have gone fast. The Lord slash Bishop also gave me the instruction and my privilege to receive tonight's offering in honor of and in love for our speaker, the Reverend Brother Bishop Dorian. He's no stranger to us. We, you've heard all of the accolades throughout this camp meeting. You've heard him praised. You've heard him exalted and lauded. I just want to share something else. A few years back, summertime, hot. A friend of mine and a parishioner of Pastor Randy, member of the beginning, lived across the street. He said, Pastor Randy, he said, I'm putting together a float fishing trip with the pastor an administrative bishop, would you like to go? I said, look, visit for the world. We have seen a uh, bishop highly anointed. Highly anointed. And I mean just tear our hearts out, mend it, and put it back in. But I've seen another side of him. <laughs> and I learned something that I did not learn in Sunday school, and that was about situational truth. <laughs> we were several hours into our fishing float trip and the fish weren't biting. The river was slack and the sun was hot and someone got the bright idea we ought to just jump in the river. Our ministry bishop at the time said, Eddie, you jump in first and I'll join you. This is where I learned about situational truth. Because Eddie did in fact jump in. The bishop, however, did not. <laughs> Even though he called to him, come on, you promised. At some point, Pastor Randy couldn't handle no more and he jumped in. And he found out why the bishop had no sense to stay in the boat. When he stopped squeaking like a little girl, <laughs> he 
got back in the boat and we went on down the river. <laughs> but something I learned about Mr. Doherty that day was that he was human. He was a man who enjoyed things like we enjoy things and could have fun and fellowship. It makes it all the more important when you've seen the man to see God when God infuses the man and he brings the word of God like he's been bringing the word of God. I am excited to sit one more time and hear whatever God is going to bring and feed us. But before we receive anything of the Lord, we've offered up praise and worship and it was awesome. I don't know what it's like back there. I've never really set up here before, but it was just like the, the floor was moving. I wasn't dancing. That floor was moving. Was just, you know. But we've already offered up praise. But now let us present in our hands an offering. To a man who's fed us and blessed us and been our leader and our guide. And before we send him back to the labor which God has called him to, let's just let him know how much Northwest loves him, what he's meant to us. And let's just, with love, feed him before he feeds us. It's just a gift, a blessing. The Bible says, it says that God loves a cheerful giver. And it is a joy and a cheerful Thing in my heart to share with this my brother and my leader, the one who has blessed and fed, but to share something tangible with him. Would you like to do that with me as well? Yes. If you would, you would you stand and you please? I kind of drug that last part out just a little bit to give you time for your, you know, your emotions to kind of catch up to you just a little bit there for you to prepare. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then if you would, if you would just bring your gift, place it in the bucket, and we'll say, I love you. Appreciate you. Bishop Thornton. Father, what a privilege it has been to be in your house. Already this evening we have been blessed with this spirit. Already this evening we have seen the glory. But God, we know that it's like going to a banquet table and you get the main course, but you keep your fork because the best is yet to come. So Father, we know that in just a moment, heaven will be open to us. And we will be fed from your throne room. We ask though first, that you would accept our gift as we give it to your man, your prophet. For truly you will bring the words of the living God to us. Please accept and receive our gift. Let it express the love that we have. Let it be blessed. We give you praise and we give you glory in everybody's name. Amen. And beautiful is your creation.
arrangements when Ron Matthews and Barbara were assigned to the Northwest. For the last, the last few days, he has kind of let me be greedy on certain things that God is setting, setting him up for and setting the region up for and some dreams and goals and plans. And I'm telling you, I'm excited for the Northwest. Um, you're in for a great ride. The Lord tarries is coming. You're in for a great ride. And uh, it's good to have fresh eyes. And then it's even doubly good to have fresh eyes that, that understands what you're seeing. Because of Bond's experience, Bishop Matthew's experience in the Northwest. And um, I, I'm, just, I'm just elated <coughs> about the future of our, of our works, our churches, our people. This movement here in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. And uh, I believe you've got the right couple leading you at this time, yes, this Lord. season. Yes. And uh, I sincerely mean that. I really do. Our committee got it right. They got it right. And uh, I thank God for it. Um, all the ministers that's been here, it's, it flatters me to have a preacher come hear me preach. I mean, I say flatter, it humbles me you know, in a great way to have a preacher come to me preach. And uh, I honor you men and you ladies that serve the ministry for being here this week. And I just want to visit for a second. Bob, I love you. And uh, uh, we just thank God for you and, and your family, Randy and Lisa. And let me just say one thing. You know, we said, hadn't this music been great and all this stuff, but let me just point out something. You just don't do this. This takes a lot of time. Right. Right. Then, every one of these people that played this week, they were here early and they, they got off of their jobs and they came here and, and they did it for nothing. They should be paid. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I appreciate it because they, they are what makes our service what they are. They set the stage for what God wants to do in the service. And I hope I don't get Vaughn upset with me. And I don't say this for any self-gratification um, or acknowledgement, but it's a deep conviction. And I hope no one in the building gets upset with me about what I'm about to tell you because I feel like making some, something clear and it's not for self-aggrandizement. It's for, um, I just didn't want you to think Money went one way or one place and it didn't go there where you used to give it. Uh, when the bishop called me months ago and asked me to come instantly, I had a request and he said that he would fulfill that. And I know this had to go through your parameters tonight. But uh, I want to tell the good people that gave to me tonight that uh, I, I received the offering with love, but I committed back to the state office of, of Washington, Oregon, and I remember. If for nothing else, but this, this bishop helps preachers. He helps churches. And there may be some underpaid preachers that need help coming to the summer conferences. And uh, I am paid well. I am paid too well. Uh, Texas uh, Council, State Council heard I was coming, and I told them I was coming under certain conditions. And they said, well, since you're doing that, we're going to... We're going to pay for your way. We're going to pay for that. They won't have to take care of anything. As a matter of fact, Bishop, my room will be paid for in the morning. Uh, Texas it won't be on Thank you. Uh, and, and besides that, Texas gave me a good offering. You know, I preached our winter camp meeting because our speakers didn't come. They were snowed in in Chattanooga. So I had to wind up preaching. And I and when I did in those offerings, I gave it to underprivileged preachers. I said, I'm not taking anything from them. The council wouldn't have it. And they found out I was coming here. So I said, we're going to give you an offering. So I'm taken care of. I'm well taken care of. And I'd rather your funds stay in your regional office to help your work. Not for me. As you understand, I'm not doing it for kudos. Uh, Bishop knows who I'm, why I'm doing this. He understands. He sacrifices. He's given up a tremendous church with tremendous income to do what he does. And he, he did it in Canada. He took a tremendous pay cut. And he's done it because he loves preachers. He loves churches. And uh, he understands why I'm doing this. And it's not for kudos or pats on the back and all that stuff. So, But I, I didn't want to leave here. You think your money came to me. And I didn't.
did something different with it. I want you to know that that's what I did. I, I take it. Thank you. God bless you for giving to me, but it belongs here. Okay? Uh, the Lord this week, uh, sometimes we ascribe things to the Lord that he had nothing to do with. And by the way, Randy, you were powerful. Uh, I don't know if you've ever made that presentation of World Missions, but they're going to hear uh, your name in the next board meeting that we need to somehow duplicate that and put that on the field. Sometimes we ascribe things as being the Lord. The Lord has nothing to do with it, but certainly I feel like the last four nights, uh, the Lord has moved in this place in a promise. Can I just tell you how I really feel? It's been on like a pot in that bone. Now, if you're from, from New Beginnings, you understand what I'm saying. You know, you've kind of picked up my, my jargon and, uh, and my little isms and stuff. But uh, it has been wonderful this week. And when the Spirit of the Lord moves like He's moved, it had, you know, that's the only way I can explain it. It's on like a pot of neck bone. But uh, tonight, I'm going to have to set this up. Uh, tonight, I believe God has brought us all to this night. Amen. For what the Lord has given me for this night. Now, when I preach here, sometimes I feel like I've got my finger stuck in a 110 socket. And I may feel that way tonight, but I may not get my leg up high. I don't know what I'll do. I just don't know. But I, I do feel the dynamic presence of God's Spirit in this place to preach His Word. And I want to get it doing that. I believe everything done this week has been done to get us here, right here in this place tonight. <coughs> And I pray and ask that you go with me to where God has taken us. If you have your Bible tonight, and it, and it may be prepared for the screen, I want you to turn with me to the book of Esther. And when I pastor, I preach predominantly, well, the majority of the time, out of the Old Testament. I had, had a member complain to me some years ago, you're just an Old Testament preacher. You know, I preach out of the New Testament a lot, but I did preach more out of the Old Testament. And, uh, you know, it kind of bothered me. But, but you know, the Old Testament, is, it sets the stage for the New. And, uh, and I'm back there again tonight. But before through with it, I think we'll be over in the covenant before it's done. The book of Esther, chapter 4. You'll stand to your feet. And can I tell you tonight that I have never preached this before. God has given this to me for this service. I may preach it in the future again with God's service X, but I stayed in the hotel room yesterday and the day before pounding this out, and I believe God wants to speak to this body tonight. Amen. Esther 4 and 13, then for the Kai, told him to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to return this answer to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Those last words is the theme tonight of which I speak. If I perish, I perish. We may be seated. Yeah. 
Sadly, there are misguided religions and cults today and have nearly always been that believe if they die in battle for their religion that they will go to heaven. In other words, that they will earn entrance into God's glory. They don't know that someone has already died for them. Back in the war, when Japan was fighting, in particular fighting America, the kamikaze pilots of the Japanese Air Force terrorized American naval fleets. Around 5,000 kamikazes were involved and were very destructive against our military. Their goal was one man, one ship. Even today, terrorists believe that it's an honor to die and carry out a terrorist activity, even with killing women and children. They're dying, they think, guarantees their entrance into heaven. However, as Christians, for Christians, we are called to live for Christ. This is a major difference between those religions and Christianity. Christ gives us life and asks us in return to live for him. However, we must be sold out to him and be willing to die, but not seeking to die. The Christian isn't asked to commit suicide, but we must be so committed to the faith that we are willing to die for the sake of of the gospel. This message tonight is about commitment. This is not a feel-good message. I believe one of the worst problems that face the church today is the lack of commitment. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16 and 15 that the household of Stephanus had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I believe that is what happens when a person is truly called of God. The ministry is an addiction. Ruth said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, she said, whether thou goest, I will go. The paraphrase for this statement to be used of the Lord is, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go there. I might have questions about it. I, I might have some apprehensions about it. But there is never a thought on my part not to do it. He is the captain of our salvation, and we are his soldiers. What if we're sent to a dangerous place, a place where there is rampant wickedness? Or to a country where a revolution is taking place and peril is on every hand? We go. Why? Because we are not our own. We are bought with a price. What a terrible price he has paid for our sin. Tonight I want to look at the statement of Esther when she would have to place her life at risk for her people to save them. Esther said, I will go see the king, although it is against the law, and I could be killed, but if I perish, 
I think. What a powerful statement. Whatever I have to do, I will do it to save my people. There are many others who are faced with similar circumstances and choose the same path as Esther did. The three Hebrew children chose that path. When faced with death in a fiery furnace, these men refused to bow down and worship the golden image. They said, you can play the music until the cows come home, but we will not bow to that image. If he doesn't deliver us, we still will not bow. Their message to Nebuchadnezzar was similar to Esther's. If we perish, Stephen, the first martyr of the church, was acquainted with that same feeling yeah. and position. The devil's crowd, they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon Stephen and they seized him and brought him to the council and also set up false witnesses against him. I love Stephen and, and here's this crowd and he, he's outnumbered by hundreds and maybe even by thousands to one and, and there wasn't anybody around who stood with him and Stephen delivered this powerful message and he had he, now see, that had he toned it down a little bit, he might have lived but Stephen said, in a sense if I perish I perish ten of the twelve disciples were martyrs all of these men had one thing in common Regardless of the circumstances and regardless of the difficulty and regardless of the pain, they had a made up mind. Their motto was as the motto of Esther and it was, if I perish, I perish. Paul was ready to die in the cross. Paul on his way to Jerusalem he stopped in Ephesus and met with the elders of the church and he shared with them that the Holy Ghost witnessed to him bombs were, were waiting for him in Jerusalem. But the Bible says there in Acts 20 and 24, Paul said these words, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And it was here that the Ephesians wept. In Acts 21, 13, Paul answered, What do you mean weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He was saying, Don't cry anymore. If I perish, I perish. Some Christians today will complain about a hangnail. <laughs> People today don't want to hear preaching about taking up their cross. Yeah. Following Christ. Well, oh yeah, we, we hear a lot of preaching about taking up life, a life of affluence. A life of a, a huge bank account. A life of flying a jet plane. Oh sure, he says, uh, he says, uh, uh, take up power and take up Influence and follow me. Did you say that? No. The Bible says, let him take up his cross and follow me. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I sincerely, sincerely 
should believe the doctrine of affluence. A doctrine that your wealth is a barometer of your spirituality is one of the most damaging and erroneous doctrines that have ever been preached today. Yeah. Yeah. I personally know in Texas two billionaires, two individual billionaires. I know them. They're connected to our church. I have pastors that are millionaires in Texas. But does anybody really believe that our wealth impresses God? <laughs> Second Chronicles 1 and 15. Also the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones. Woo! Gold was as plentiful in Jerusalem as rocks on the ground. Matter of fact, the streets in New Jerusalem are going to be paved with the stuff. <coughs> you can't buy God's favor. In times like these, we need someone to stand in the gap and make up the heads. We need men and women who are committed and sold out regardless of the cost. They are determined and committed to live for God and to please Him. Let's, let's look at Esther for an answer. Mordecai, Esther's uncle, told her in Esther 3 and 15, And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. God places us where he needs us. Amen. Time of great persecution. Great tribulation, God has those He can trust to be in the thick of, thick of the battle. What is the background of this statement? If I perish, I perish. Esther and her uncle Mordecai are Jews, and evil Haman, the right hand man of the king, had tricked the king to, to, into signing a decree that on a certain day all the Jews in every province. And every district would be healed. That the Jews were to be completely exterminated. The king didn't know that Esther and Mordecai were Jews. And he had signed the law, the Medes and the Persians, and it could not be changed. And Esther and Mordecai and, and their friends and, uh, went into prayer and they fasted for three days. And they knew that, that God was the only one that could help them. Just as he is the only one that can help us today. Amen. Mordecai and Esther must approach the king and intercede on the behalf of the Jews. Going to the king without an invitation could cost her her life. Then Esther made a great statement. She said, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She was the most pitied woman in that part of the world. She had everything that a woman could desire. And now the roof is falling in on her. She tries to help her people, she would be risking death. If she ignored it and only uh, thought of herself and kept her, her race a secret, then she might would survive. She said, if I perish, I perish. She said, whatever the cost, I am willing to pay it. Regardless of her personal losses, she would do all she could, even if it cost her her life trying. I can't tell you tonight what battles you will face. Battles you face by living in a secular society. Preaching the word of God to a sneering hostile world in an anti-Christian culture. 
But I know one thing. We must be determined, whatever the cost, that we will live a victorious life. Not a successful life in the judgment of this world, but a successful life by God's standards. Amen. Esther was not going to sit on the sideline and watch the horror that would befall her people. She wasn't going to take the attitude that I'm only a woman, I'm only one person, there isn't anything I can do. No, she went to the king and she exposed Haman and the Jews were spared and Haman was hanged on the very scaffold that he had built for Mordecai. And I tell you tonight that God is still God. Amen. He called us. He's our protector. He's our provider. And he's our source for all things. We must always travel the road that he has marked regardless of the dangers along the road. Paul said in Romans 8 and 35, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Amen. Shall persecution or distress or, or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Finally, 
they, they were prepared for the but if not. You need to get ready for that. All right now. What if God doesn't need our schedule? What if God decides not to deliver us? Does that mean he's not God? Does that mean we will run back home and blame God? This is the hard part of following you. Uh, an old Quaker was heard talking to God in this manner one day. He said, God, I am not surprised that you have as few friends as you do because of the way you treat the ones that you have. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? <laughs> there are times I've said, God, do you know where I am? God, do you care? Well, why, why do the wicked people prosper? I'm sure we can find plenty of people in the Bible who have probably felt like God didn't come through for them. It appeared God didn't come through to bring Moses out of the wilderness until after 40 years. It appeared that God didn't come through to release Samson from the listing prison. It appeared that God didn't come through to keep Daniel out of the lion's den. It appeared that God didn't come through for Jeremiah to keep him out of prison and out of the dungeon. It appeared that God didn't come through to keep Job out of the clutches of the devil and to keep him from losing all of his ten children. Amen. It appeared that God didn't come through to save Nabal from the cruel death at the hands of Jezebel's henchmen. It appeared that God didn't come through to keep Joseph from being sold into Egyptian slavery. Nor from the lies of Potiphar's wife. It appeared that God didn't come through to preserve the life of John the Baptist. Instead, his head was brought on a platter to please a godless woman. It appeared that God didn't come through for Paul to keep him from a shipwreck, from stoning, from imprisonment, and finally martyrdom. It appeared that God didn't come through to keep the Apostle John from being banished on the Isle of Patmos. It appeared that God didn't come through for the ten disciples when they were martyred by cruel means of death. On the surface, it appeared that God didn't come through for Jesus to keep him from the cross. But there is a huge difference in God's act and God's way. He may allow many to see his eyes, but only a few are entrusted the knowledge of his ways. When God doesn't come through many times, it's because we're unprepared. Or he has a greater work for us to do. Moses may need 40 years on the backside of nowhere to prepare his heart to lead God's children out of Egypt. There's people that think they can jump out there and lead God's sheep, but God told Moses, look, you've got to practice on your fallen off sheep where you practice to work on mine. Yeah. It was when Joseph was prepared that he was elevated to the prime minister to Egypt. God didn't deliver the three Hebrew children from the furnace because he wanted to deliver them in it. Amen. God didn't deliver Paul from prison because he wanted the epistles to be written there. God didn't keep John from the Isle of Patmos because he wanted the book of Revelation. God didn't keep Jesus from the cross because the death of Jesus was the only means of paying for the death of sin. Yes, there are times when God doesn't come through in our timing. But He always comes through. Amen. 
God had brought Esther to this place and, and at this time to be used of him. So she was facing death. And her family and her people were to be exterminated. God is at work in our lives even when we can't see him work. In these difficult times, God needs men and women who are not at ease in Zion, who are not satisfied with a comfort zone, who are not satisfied with the status quo. Spurgeon referred to a martyr's homegoing, a homegoing. Mr. Hawks, when he was, his lower extremities were burnt, and they were expecting to see him fall over the chain by which he was dangling into the fire. Mr. Hawks lifted up his flaming hands, each fingers spurting fire, and he clapped them three times with a shout, None but Christ! None but Christ! Persecution clears the church of the dross and the hypocrisy. When cast into the fire, pure gold loses nothing. Only dross and tin. Two thousand years of men and women had triumphed and conquered through the flames of the fire by the guilty on crosses, the cauldron of oil, watery graves, bishops have died, missionaries have died, laborers have died, businessmen and women have died, farmers have died, the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich have died, triumphing the ter trumpeting the testimony of victory as they left this world. What a testimony of the age Hugh Lattimore when facing martyrdom. He pulled off all his clothing but his shirt and he spoke to encourage his friend, friend Dr. Ridley. And here's what he said. Courage, brother! We shall this day light such a candle in England as I trust by the grace of God shall never be put out. <clears throat> They become part of the great multitude that Paul referred to in Hebrews 11, of whom the world is not worthy. My question is, in times like these, when the fire on the altar in so many churches is dying, and the majority of Christians are more interested in things that fade away rather than eternal, how are we to respond. Are we like Esther and say in times like these, if I perish, I perish. But whatever the cost, Jesus, I am sold out. Are we like Paul and say, I'm not only willing to go to prison, but I'm willing to die for my Lord? Are we like you, Vladimir? And want to light such a candle that by the grace of God it will never Are we willing, like Solomon, to say, What is this sanctuary we have built if not for genuine worship and the glory of God? My question to you tonight, to ministers in the church doors alike, are you committed to death? Are you ready to go to prison? When God doesn't answer the way that you want him to, when he doesn't travel by your schedule, when you don't always understand God's decision or his answer, are you ready to forge on ahead, or are you tempted to throw in the towel? I remember a few years ago, I could let me personal for a moment, when I didn't get an answer to what I wanted or expected me. I went home and locked the door and pulled down the shade. For several days I didn't pray. 
I didn't even read my Bible. I just looked at and stared at the walls in the house, the parsonage I was in. I didn't want to talk on the phone. I turned it off. I wanted, I wanted God to tell me why he made a decision so contrary to what I wanted and what I'd asked him for. People phoned me eventually from everywhere. They wondered if, if they had, I wondered if they'd ever been where I had been and where I was. Maybe I wasn't as close to God as I thought. How, how could I be so wrong? I wasn't being comforted by the Holy Spirit because I, was, I wasn't ready for His coming. I was too busy feeling pity and feeling sorry for myself. I didn't want anything to upset my grief. I was miserable, made everybody around me miserable. I then realized that God wasn't through with me. I want you to know that God is not through with you yet. If you haven't received an answer, realize that He is able. If He doesn't answer the way you desire, He has a higher will to display His love and redemptive power in your life. This is kind of the way I want to bring this thought tonight to a conclusion. I'm going to ask one of the talented men I know, most talented singers I know, Brother Carlos, to come. It's an old song. I want him just to sing it a cappella. I want you to hear the words of this song. Then I want to tell you how this song derived. <coughs> the song's title is I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, Listen. still I will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me. husband and his wife, there were no other converts in India at that time. 
but this one husband and his wife and their two children. They had professed faith in Christ and they were baptized. Their village leaders decided to make an example out of the husband. They arrested the entire family. They demanded that the father renounce Christ or he would see his wife and children murdered right in front of him. When he refused, his two children were executed. Given another chance to recant, the man again refused and his wife was similarly struck down. Still refusing to recant, the man followed his family into glory. Witnesses reported that when asked to recant or see his children murdered, the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. After seeing his children killed, he reportedly said, The world behind me, the cross before me. And after seeing his wife pierced by arrows, he said, Though none go with me, still I will follow. It was then that his life was taken. In such amazement, the tribe that stood there and watched this episode, the chief, looking at the puddle of blood of his family life, said, I have never seen such commitment in my life. I decree that this village from this day forward will serve this man's God. Sing, Father. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. Are you willing to follow him tonight? To follow Jesus. Regardless of the sacrifice. I have decided. Regardless of the road. You have to travel. To follow I want you to come tonight and hear the voice of the Lord. The world behind me, the cross before me. I mean, there's people here tonight saying, the world behind me, the cross before me. The Let's come and sing. We're ready to make a commitment. We're living in perilous times. It's all.
Your word is powerful. Let your word complete the work you've sent to do. Give us resolve more than we've ever had. God, we will make heaven our home. And we will do our best to aid and assist others to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Kept chasing, kept chasing, kept chasing. Finally, I decided, hey, I'll just, I'll go to church. 
basically, and you know the old saying, guys, and many of us have done it, I'm going to go one time to shut him up, leave me alone, and I went, and, um, you know, he's a good preacher, he's, he can sing, he can do all those things, but that's not what got me. What got me was he loved me right where I was at. He didn't try to try to make me all over. He just he just loved me, and uh, and I couldn't believe it when he actually asked me to preach. I thought to myself, this man's insane because I've got a bull, I've got a bullseye on my back. People aren't going to like this. And you know what him and his wife did for Lisa and I? He took every bullet and every arrow. And we didn't even know he was taking it. That's the sign of a good man. And, uh, so I say that I've said it before. I will probably say it again. Uh, every soul that's been saved here, we, this is our model. This is who we are. One more soul here at New Beginnings. And every one of them that's been saved, I think in 14 years, I think we've had over a thousand people come to the Lord. And, and uh, now they're not all here. You know, a lot of things happen, but that was conservatively speaking. And uh, Brother and Sister Puller have a, have a hand in every single one of them. So we thank you for that. And all the other pastors and all the preachers that are here, would you guys stand? Come on, let's give them a hand, all right? Thank you, guys. And all over our, our And, uh, and then, of course, our, our uh, Brother Vaughn Matthews and his wife came in as our bishop. And, and uh, I, I have I've fallen in love with this couple. They are absolutely amazing. And when he called me about the camp meeting that we have here, uh, he started talking to me. And I'm talking to him. And I said, well, this is kind of what we're doing. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know what he was going to say. And here's what he said. Paraphrase. Is it working? I said, well, yes, sir, it is. He said, well, don't break anything then. I never, I'm never, i not kidding. Well, don't do anything different then. If it's working, let it go. And that's who they are. They come in. They don't have to change everything. They just say, if it's working, let's get it going. And we appreciate that so very, very much. And you have, you know, some people, let's face it. Uh, you guys don't talk about it. There's some people you have to learn to like. You know anybody like that? You just got to learn. They just, you know, it's like a fungus. They grow on you after a while, right? Well, that's not this couple. You just love them. You meet them and you love them. And that's just the way it is. And uh, we are we are so privileged to be under your leadership. And we thank you for what you are doing in the Pacific Northwest. You have made all of us better. And we appreciate it. Five years that we've been doing this. Now listen, but Bishop Dory is he's, he's not he's not my personal bishop anymore, so I'm not scoring any points here. But I think every pastor that is here would agree with me that out of the five years that we have been having this meeting, this is by far the best that we have ever had. <laughs>
how incredible you are. Remember there was a preacher that believed if you lied, you burned in hell. That told you, you're incredible. Would you stand to your feet? There's something that the Bishop Darnley, when he had one of the men come for a conference, changed my life forever. Here's what he did. He the man stood up and he he said, there are times, and pastors, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you to do this if you're not already. We've talked about some of this before. But there are people that come to your church that, number one, they're not going to agree with everything you say. And some of them aren't going to agree with anything you say. You have different people coming to your church. You have young, you have old. Different cultures coming to your church. And sometimes when they come in, they don't even understand what you're saying. We use phrases like, the spirit fell. They're thinking, pick him up. There is something I learned that most people in America know. If they don't know it by heart, they know the premise. Very simple. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. So what we do around the beginnings is there may be times that I'm preaching and I'm looking at somebody and it's almost as if something doesn't register. And they just sit there. But at the end of our service, we all repeat the Lord's Prayer. Someone says, well, does it work? Invariably, I will look at the ones while saying that that have not responded the whole service and they will be reciting the Lord's Prayer as it is on the screen. Well, what else does it do? Raise hand, can you? My little redhead over there. That's the one that does my hair. Her little boy is how old? Five years old. And just a few weeks back, I gave him the microphone and he led the congregation in the Lord's Prayer. It'll work, folks, if you just teach. Amen? So before we go eat, let's say it together. Are you ready? Hang on a second. Are we ready? Thumbs up. Here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen.